Running commentary. We are exploring listening to albums. It is a lost art form. We took an hour out of our day. We switched off the phones. We switched off the computers. We did not answer the door. We sat down and we listened to the artist's vision and concept. Requested by Neil Barker from Top Sin. The Boomtown Rats, a tonic for the troops. The first thing that strikes me here is the album Sleeve, which I absolutely love. Um, it has like a desert kind of very yellow sand, very blue sky. And then you have the band sort of lined up, Bob Gale at the front, the rest of the band are sort of lined up with their various instruments. And then a lion has his nose up someone's butt at the, the back of the album sleeve, which I thought was uh, a little scary. I don't know if I'd want a, a big uh, a big pussycat sniffing my backside. But um, very interesting visuals, very interesting titles. And the styling of this band, I have to say, was really infectious. I liked I liked it. I liked what I saw in terms of the band styling. So no matter what, the band are off to a great start because I like the song titles and I like the visuals. This does matter. You know, marketing does matter. It's important. We'll, we'll do a run through of the, of the song titles and then we'll sort of get into more specifics. Like Clockwork is the first track on the UK version of the album. Uh, hit single from 1978 and number six record tick tick tock da na na da na 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 you know very good very good song from 78 very good song from the boomtown rats um i like this song you know it's it's just it's sort of a it's a stylish piece it works you know 78 is this really transitional year a lot of disco happening punk is kind of 77's the big year for punk there's still punk in 78 but, you know, the sensibility of uh, disco is really still throughout ABBA, Boney M, John Travolta, Olivia Newton-John, Taste of Honey. A lot of, lot of disco still going on here. It's almost like it had more of a resurgence again in 78. Not that punk was dead, but more that it was the initial flair of punk in 78 for me. If I look back at the charts, it's kind of, there's a sort of... Uh, how should we put it? It's almost like a candy coating of punk. They've like, oh yeah, okay, we get it. So we're gonna put this veneer on punk to make it saleable to the average person. Whereas 77, I feel like it was a little bit more stripped down to its roots. Blind Date, Been Alone Too Long. Really like this, -na 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 -na. Been Alone Too Long. Good song, good second track. I Never Loved Eva Brown. What is it about the 70s and references to um, Nazis and Holocaust and Jewish stuff? Um, you know, one of my favorite comedians is John Cleese and he, in the 70s, regularly mentioned Jews and Germans and Hitler and stuff that really in this day and age is just not really acceptable. It's actually really uncomfortable to kind of have a sort of sense of humor about anything related to you know, mass genocide. I never loved Eva Brown. I, you know, I, I guess they're trying to be humorous and I can see that it sort of ties into Monty Python, 40 Towers, maybe that's why it's there. That I'm really uncomfortable with that title. Eva Brown was his and companion and for about 12 hours his wife before uh, they committed suicide. Living in an Island is a song about suicide. Um, yeah, it works. It's very 78. This song, Neil, this album, Neil, is very textbook 1978. The background vocals are very, they're very concerned with style and what is not disco. We're not going to be doing disco harm in a disco way because that's not cool with the kids. It feels very calculated, this album. Um... And that's okay because we've got really smart people on board. So I, I don't have a problem with the fact that it's a clever album. Um, I just, you know, we do bear that in mind because it kind of factors in as to why maybe this didn't quite pop as a as a punk album because it had a lot enough pretensions and enough fancy clothing to make it a little, 
you know, I don't think that the band protests to be punk all the way. But they're, so they're in this sort of new wave territory. They're between the two, almost in a Blondie way, but before Blondie did it. So it's, it's awkward. There are times when it feels a little like, oh, okay. But the band as a unit are solid. I really like the Boomtown Rats as a band. They clearly care about what they're doing. These guys clearly know each other and work to, together really well as a unit. Don't Believe What You Read. Yeah, great song. She's So Modern is a tonic for the troops. Is This is where the lyric comes from. It's a lyric lift from this track. It just makes me think of the Ramones. I don't know who came first. I don't know if the Ramones or the Boomtown Rats. You know, she's so modern. She's so da da da. She's so like da da da. Like I don't think of this as the Boomtown Rats. Like if anyone played this to me, even now, I'm still kind of in denial that this is a Boomtown Rats track. I don't really accept it as a Boomtown Rats song. I get it as something that wants to be part of what's happening. It's a number 12 record in 1960. I'm really, really not against the song, but I get that it's almost like a foot in the door kind of track. Like, I don't believe that they, this was really who they were. Um, me and Howard Hughes, Wall Street Cocoon. Um, Howard Hughes is again mentioned by the Teardrop Explodes in Reward in 1981. Howard Hughes is this character that people are fascinated with, Howard Hughes. Here he is, Melvin and Howard, 1980. Uh, what's her name? Mary Steenburgen wins the Oscar for Melvin and Howard as a supporting role. I don't get the fascination with Howard Hughes. I, I, I think there's something vaguely interesting about being really rich and reclusive, but... These characters, you know, we've got Howard Hughes and we've got Eva Brown. Okay, so there's two characters on the album that I don't really care about. Like Howard Hughes, I, I, I don't get it. I, someone can tell me, well, what's the fascination with Howard Hughes? He has more, he's like the Bill Gates of his era. Is that what we're talking about? Why are people interested in this character? Why did we make a movie called The Aviator? Yes, Leonardo DiCaprio was great. Yes, Kate Blanchett was great. I don't get it. I, I don't get what this fascination with Howard Hughes is, but then, you know, I did. I wasn't here when this mattered, I guess. Somebody can help me out with this. Can't Stop is about euthanasia. This is a, you know, very good, up-tempo kind of thing, talking about just when it's time to go, as I'm still alive and you don't want to be anymore. So it sort of ties in with suicide, but it's euthanasia as in, I'm an old person and I no longer have a purpose. Um, Watch out for the normal people. I told you that I did actually, you know, like these titles. Watch out for the normal people. Yeah, really. Absolutely. Do watch out for them. That's what the record companies were looking for were bands with a huge guitar presence. Two guitar players and the Boomtown Rats did indeed have that. Um, Alan Holmes is on saxophone. The American version of the album included Mary of the Fourth Form and Joey's on the Street Again from the band's debut album, um, which was the, called the Boomtown Rants. Um, Can't Stop and The Normal People are not included on the US version. The band are named after a gang of children in Woody Guthrie's autobiography. The band were mostly from Dunleary in Ireland, which is a suburban seaside town in County Dublin, with Pete Brigette hailing from County Cavan. In the summer of 1976, the band played their first gig in the UK. There's lots of energy and showmanship here. It strikes me as I listen to albums from this time era that there were self-imposed restraints on what artists would allow themselves to do post-punk for fear of being perceived as on call. I say this because I hear echoes of each other's riffs. Sa plan pour moi uh, by Plastic Bertrand uh, springs to mind in this case. You know, this huge like wham wham motor splash thing, you know, this big punk hit from number six hit again from 78. I hear you know, the elements of that. Um, there's lots of references in the background vocals as well on this album to 60s girl groups in sort of background vocal style. It's sort of like they do what, what the 60s used to do, but as guys. So it's almost like pantomime kind of, and they're really sarcastic and scathing. Um, Rat Trap really is a great song. You know, it's a fantastic song, which... I've not really been into Rat Trap up until this point. It was this song that was like, yeah, okay, I get it. It's kind of okay. But no, this time around, as I listen to it, I'm like, you know what? This is really a good song. But here's the thing. Let's talk about Rat Trap and what they did. It's the first number one by an Irish rock band. 
It was the first new wave number one. Lots of firsts here. And what did they do after nine, was it seven weeks of Summer Nights at number one and nine weeks of You're the One That I Want at number one during 1978? They very proudly ripped up a picture of John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John on their first um, top of the, for the number one performance of Rat Trap. But here's the thing. Rat Trap plays out just like a musical because it tells a story and this is what musical songs do. It has a sort of musical kind of sensibility to it. Um, it could easily feature a sort of a new wave musical. Rat Trap would be a great song and it talks about these sort of, you know, you're caught in this trap of having, you know, finding 50p in your pocket and someone's trying to watch Top of the Pops and, you know, tonight, of all nights, there's going to be a fight. This is boy heaven. This is what guys are all about. It's about the Saturday night punch up. It's about going out, getting a belly full of L and then slapping the shit out of someone who you can't stand. That's, that's completely gets the British Isles and he's Irish. So he really gets it. And in Dublin, I'm sure this is happening on a regular basis. Rat Trap is elevated to new levels with a re-listen. I'm like, this really is a great song. The one thing is the saxophone for me is like, I don't know, it's a little bit redundant, to be honest with you. Bob Geldof wasn't allowed to play saxophone in the video because he hadn't, the Musicians' Union blocked that. Um, they epitomized the 1978 sound, particularly with the choice of harmonies. I think it's com fair to compare them to the cars. There's a lot of times where they sound like, when I think of my best friend's girl and what the cars were doing in 78, Boomtown Rats and the cars are right there. Um, you know, uh, the Boomtowns are on Ensign Records in the UK. Um, and I think, are they on Atlantic in the US? They're on a big label in the US, but there's, I think they got signed in the US because they sounded like the cars. I can't see any other reason why they would have really been taken up. As is often the case with requested albums, people tend to select the band's earlier work. They want me to focus on the genesis of what I loved about the band. Um, and I don't know why people are so fascinated with my opinion on people's earlier work. I tend to like the, I do tend to like the flower. I tend to like the, the foliage better than the root. Um, the, boom found, the Boomtown Rats for me are defined by I Don't Like Mondays and Banana Republic and I really love Someone's Looking At You. And as a result of listening to this album, I can express a genuine respect for Rat Trap. In final summation of the album, um, Tonic for the Troops, Boomtown Rats, requested by Neil Barker from Pop Scene, the final mark is 72%.